This episode of To The Journey is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 150,000 titles for your desktop or mobile device. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter. Visit enterpriseinspace.org for more details. Hi, I'm Manuente Reme. I played Ichev on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. I think it's safe to say that no one on this crew has been more obsessed with getting home than I have. But when I think about everything we've been through together, Maybe it's not the destination that matters. Maybe it's the journey. If that journey takes a little longer, so we can do something we all believe in, I can't think of any place I'd rather be, or any people I'd rather be with. To the journey. You're here. To the journey. 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 Hi everyone at home and welcome. This is To The Journey. I'm your co-host Kay Shaw and with me as always are Suzanne Williamson and Zachary Fruling. So I am really excited because we have a very special guest with us today on the show. We have got Manu Entereme. Hi Manu. Hey guys, how are you? We're doing great. It's great to talk great, to you again. Yeah. You and I talked about, uh, I guess, about 10 months ago now over on my other show, Metatrex, and it's great to have you back. Yeah, it's cool to be here. This is the Voyager podcast. Yeah. Ooh, well, then I fit right in. I was on that. Were you on that show? I, I thought were you? you were over on Deep Space yeah. Nine. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, I was on that show. A couple, couple of years there. Or at least a character that I played was on that show. Depends on how you look at reality. <laughs> it's, it was so long ago, though. It's got to seem like another lifetime. Yeah, it was. It was like 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. 16 years ago, I think. Hold on. 2017. When did we did we finish in 02 or 01? I want to say 01, 01, I think. Really? Well, well, 15, 16 years. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Um and it, but uh, honestly, it doesn't seem like that long ago. I mean, it does in the sense when I look in the mirror, I'm old, but it, it the memories are very fresh because I've you know, I've spent a lot of time going around um, to different Star Trek conventions and Comic Cons around the world and getting asked questions and about it. But also, just that it was such a special time in my life. I think it. Any time I think about it, it feels like yesterday because uh, the memories are, are are mostly fresh in my mind. It's. It must be kind of magical to be able to be. I mean, just being part of it, of course. But it's. It's like the whole thing is frozen in time. I mean, you know, you have this nice finished project, you know, that we know as Voyager, this thing that we fans know and love, and you know, it's just. Um, it's an artifact. It's something that will live forever. It's. It's. It's uh, written in history at this point. Yeah, for sure. It's sort of like. It's sort of like a double-edged sword. I find myself. And it's hard to explain it without sounding like a, a complete dick. But I find myself sometimes just completely humble and happy and thankful for all of it and and for being granted all the things that being on that show has given me and as far as life experience and acting experience and uh opportunities to to continue and further my career in acting but then at the same time i wasn't on that show for seven years like the will wheatons of the world or you know the 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 regular guest i mean the regular casts so i was on the show long enough to get famous but not rich but pigeonholed Totally. <laughs> no, exactly what you mean. So I'm st- I'm still like the space boy, but I I never got the money. I got the fame and not the money. So I've always been a little bit kind of <laughs> bummed about that. 
I, I think something that's that's true of, of Voyager fans in general is that Voyager fans love Voyager almost to a greater degree than I'd, I'd say fans of the other Star Trek series love their show. Voyager fans are like, we're in the minority and we're the diehard loyalists. So I think, we, you know, generally we love you. You're part of the team. You're part of the group. <laughs> but I, I guess what I'm, I, I was trying to think of an easy way to ask this and I couldn't think of a good way to ask it. So I'm just going to throw it out there. There are some people that don't like each of, they don't like the, the Borg children. W- yeah. What do, what does that what goes on in your mind when you hear because people love you? You know, we're all we're all like I said, you're part of Team Voyager. We love you, but people don't necessarily like the character. What is that dichotomy like in your mind? Uh, it's strange for me because I, I didn't like the character the first few episodes until he was just sort of a brat, and then <laughs> as soon as the, the 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 writing for him got better and he became more of a uh, a part of the series, uh, he I bec- he became part of the, the ensemble cast for the last couple seasons there um, when they based some episodes around his character. Suddenly I, I began to love to play him. Yeah. I get a, I get a lot of, a lot of flack for, for each of, but the, the, the most difficult thing for me has been people say they don't like the board kids. They don't like the board characters and, and the word kids because I was 21 when I got that part and then 22 for season two. And I felt very much like a man when I played the role. And for some reason, because I was a baby faced actor, um, I've always gotten the reputation for playing um, one of the Borg kids. And I felt like he was a young man more than he was a kid. So I always harbor a a resentment when when people say you were one of the Borg kids. I'm like, no, I was the Borg young (laughs) man growing up and learning how to be a man. And and then getting that reputation of being like a, a child actor, and I don't ever think of myself as a, a child actor. I mean that that was my first big role, and I, I was you know I was in my twenties at the time, so I, I don't think of myself as a child. Well, that label has something of a stigma to it, like you know it can like I said it can pigeonhole you, so you don't yeah. want to necessarily be known as a child actor. It's a terrifying label, too. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So uh, another question I've got for you is just which I'm trying to think of a good way to put this. Which, which parts of either being in Star Trek or or Star Trek in general, you know, the milieu and the worldview and whatnot, have you kind of taken with you? Like, what? How has it helped shape you? Who you know, you the person who you are. Well, playing. But first of all, Ichev was such an honest, humble, good person. There was n- there was nothing bad about his spirit, his energy, his uh, loyalty, his uh, fr- commitment to friendship and uh, crew and and others. Um, you know, he he would sacrifice himself for his friend. He was just a like. I heard Jonathan Frakes talk about this once um, about his character and that. I felt the same way. And, and that is that being looked at by the fan base through the monocle of each um, as like, I've always felt like I had to live up to his qualities and I'm a foul mouthed punk rock hippie kid from uh, hippie parents um, that's, you know, angry at my country and full of, you know, hostility and, and um, um, I don't trust my government and uh, I'm so not like Egypt. So, but in a sense, it has shaped me as and helped me be a better man because I always have tried to, in a sense, live up to at least the moral qualities um, and of human relations that, that Egypt you know, he loved, he loved people. Uh, and he, he was the kind of person that would always give someone a second chance and maybe a third. And I think I'm probably a better human being. And in fact, Star Trek in general, like I said, when I was 20 years old, when I got the part, um, has shaped my whole manhood from I'm 38 now. And I've lived up in this, I've, you know, grown up in the Star Trek world. So, in a sense, that character and the Star Trek world has shaped the, the kind of man that I am now. And I think without it, um, I might not be a very good person today, honestly. I, it, it it forced me to um, – a lot of the experiences along the way of 
having tasted fame at that young age and, and um, being held up to that, uh, you know, I felt when, when people first started to meet me, I, I could feel the, that I was letting people down, you know, um, that they expected to meet this nice young boy they knew from TV. And, um, and so it was sort of a war between how, which, which parts of my personality to keep. And um, uh, I, I want to be myself, but at the same time, I don't want to be so brutally honest that I'm just an arrogant person. Um, and so it's been a, a dance between living up to the character and, and living, living up to myself. I find this really interesting because I think we all need a model to shoot for. We need role models. We need something that that stirs our moral character inside and makes us be the best version of ourselves. So like this is like the hard $64,000 question for all of us. It's really kind of a group question here. But like what is it about human nature that keeps us from being the best versions of ourselves? Why haven't we seen something like maybe not the science fiction elements, you know, with the space travel and the warp drive and those kinds of things. But why can't we become the people that we see inside? Star Trek because they're such genu- generally very good people and we all have these this inner struggle inside of us of good versus evil and the you know being the nice polite friendly person who's forgiving and the person who's judgmental and you know says bad things and you know we 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 all have this struggle in different ways why can't we overcome that and just be the best versions of ourselves I think there's t- two reasons uh, personally and then everyone else can pitch in one I think fear just the 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 word fear um and all its incarnations. I think the whole thing that we're doing here on this planet is trying to overcome that thing. Um, I also think because I'm a conspiracy nut um, and also because I see the world around me, I believe that the people in power uh, in America and in the Western nations build um, they want the populace to be afraid. It leads to more shopping and it leads to more um, uh, people just minding their P's and Q's. Uh, So I I think it's a programming of American society. One time I went into a a bowling alley and there were 10 different uh, TV screens over the, over all the different lanes and long story short, on each of the different TV screens, there was like a different competition going on. One was basketball. One was two people fighting in a boxing ring. One was two football teams from different cities. One was one guy had a, his car, his truck, and it was a commercial. And he was like, the neighbors across from him were like bummed out that they didn't have as cool of a truck as he did. And it was all, everything on the, on the TV was competition-based rugged individualism based why can't you be better than your neighbor kind of thing and that and war and everything else that that's going on uh, in the world leads to constant fear all types of fear the simplest of fear um, um you know this is so dumb but like even farting in public you know it, it's it's a terrible fear to get over this the simplest fear you know um and so i think that's what holds us back is is fear and i so for me i always try to get over my my daily struggle with saying what i want to say being who i want to be without without fear I, I think we don't really realize the extent to which each other are constantly in a state of fear. You know, we've all become so good at hiding it and putting our masks on. You know, you walk down the street, you see people that are afraid and, you know, you don't, you, they don't show it necessarily. You got to get through that wall to really connect with people. I feel that that's, that's spot on. You know, we, we all, um, and we all put on that mask that, that we're not afraid and we don't share with each other enough of what's really going on with each other. You know, there's all these stupid rules in society and you know, men can't cry and you know um you can't show your emotions in public and and don't you know don't be who you are 24 7 seems to be the rule and um for all of us to stand up and change that is going to take some leaders and some um some followers hopefully we'll we'll do it someday stop hurting each other and scaring each other and start hugging each other and supporting each other. 
And it's a shame because people are so genuinely interesting. You know, once you get past that wall, people are unique. They're beautiful snowflakes, to use a metaphor, right? And, you know, it's 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 a shame to think there's so many connections that you could form and people you could get to know and stories they could tell. And none of it happens because of those fears. It's pretty sad. Well, so, I always find that my biases are incredible and, and my judgments, like I, when I get past them, every time I have a wonderful experience. You know, I'll judge people immediately. I'll, I'll go into a coffee shop. I'll see someone sitting there and I'll be like, look, what a dork, like what an idiot, you know, and uh, you know, I'll look what he's wearing, look at his hat. And, and then all that, then I'll second guess myself and I'll go, why did you just judge that person so harshly? Like it could be a really cool person. And then I decide to initiate conversation. And then I find out that I could completely fall in love with this person. And um, you just have to stop that that programming of, of judgment and, and check people out a little closer and, and you'll find out that most people, yeah, most people are pretty cool. Yeah. I think that is definitely the thing, isn't it really? Because there's so much programming in there that we don't even realize that we have. And, and as much as you in on an intellectual level want to get past that, you've still got, you know, the lizard brain for one of a better way of putting it. Exactly. Yeah. The lizard brain goes off all the time. So <laughs> unless you are really programming yourself uh, as hard as you can uh, against it and, and trying to listen for the lizard brain doing its thing, you don't catch it and you can't stop it. The fight or flight lizard brain is, is it's our hardware, right? And so our, our software is more of what we have to design to, to stop it. And that's where we'll get into a problem because people, unfortunately, a lot of people are inherently lazy and they don't want to make that change. They don't have the desire to make that change. So they'll just continue to live in fear. Yeah, I would say that's part of the um, protocols of the ruling elite as well, is to keep us uh, lazy and um, as long as most of us have hot pockets and a microwave and a roof. We don't have to really think about anything else, you know, <laughs> I'm guilty of, I'm guilty of, of, of it too. You know. Don't knock the hot pockets, man. Don't knock them. <laughs> <laughs> Got some in my freezer right now. <laughs> well, this kind of, it kind of leads into a question I had actually, because talking about, you know, how we can, progress and how we can get past this um i was thinking about the new the new series that's coming up of star trek star trek discovery i don't know how much you you know about it um and, and on that kind of note i w i wanted to know what would your hopes be for that and how do you think that as we've seen in the past star trek lead social change how do you think you'd like to see discovery continue to do that what would you like to see on there well i I was talking about this with Michelle Nichols and Rod Roddenberry and a couple of other folks at HawaiiCon a few months back. And I think it's terribly important for Star Trek for them to have the right people running uh, the show that they will continue to do what the Star Treks of the past have done, which is use science fiction storytelling and metaphor to take on the issues of our time and to really talk about terrorism and uh, racism and uh, the World Bank and the military industrial complex and uh, all sorts of things that are going on now, I really hope that they take the Roddenberry model of sneaking in metaphorically stories about what's really going on today uh, into that science fiction and 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 I hope that they do that and I thought that they had the right team I don't know much about the other guys so when they lost Brian Fuller I was really depressed because I know Brian is speaks to that part of Star Trek and he was very much um, found that part of Star Trek to be the most important thing uh, that Star Trek did um, so I just hope that, that the other showrunners there and the producers there are willing to take on, you know, the man and the machine and, and make, make the same kind of Star Trek that Roddenberry did. 
Well, it takes such a, an intentional effort to do that, right? It would be so easy to take the lazy way out in terms of storytelling and what you want to accomplish in a, in a new Star Trek. So, but it takes some intentionality. You have to you have to write that stuff in. You have to have the goal of using it as a tool to change the world around us. Yeah, and a, a cast, a, a, a staff of intelligent uh, writers that are willing to uh, willing and able to to do to write that kind of material. That's what I mean. That's speaking of like you know Voyager making me a better person, and you know my dream show that I'm working on this year is called The Circuit, and it's basically a, a science fiction anthology TV series where each episode will be a, a different. Um, theme a different genre of science fiction and they'll all take place in the same city called Erbiesa. and each story I, I found with with sci-fi anthologies or any sort of anthology television series it's the best sort of format for attacking themes and issues of mankind and what we're dealing with um, and I don't think that I would have that as a part of my, you know, the, I'm an actor and a producer in general because I want to play parts and tell stories of other people's experience so that we can have empathy with people's experience that we don't necessarily, that we haven't necessarily lived. And I feel that like that brings us together and Star Trek has taught me that, um, and so I hope that the new Star Trek continues to do what the old Star Trek did. Being an actor and producer, um, have you ever wanted to get into directing? Is, is that something you're looking at? Yes. Um, I, I'm, you know, I've been producing for eight years now and we've, you know, done two, I've made two films. I made a film called Benjamin Troubles that I learned a whole, a lot on. It's free on Amazon Prime right now. You can see it. It's a, a cute little love story, urban fairy tale fantasy. Um, I'm proud of it. It's not exactly the movie that I wanted to make, but I, I'm definitely proud of it. I think, I think it's worth watching. And Fifth Passenger, this film that's coming up, I'm extremely proud of, but it's a really dark story and also not exactly the kind of story that if I had ultimate budget that I would want to tell, but it was enough of, there's enough of a moral in there and enough of an interesting question of, of morality uh, in the, in the plot that I felt like it was worth making. Um, but through those two films, I, I definitely decided that everything I do from now on, I'm not willing to sacrifice any of the message that I want to get out to the universe through my art. And, um, you know, hopefully I'll get a chance with this next project um, to do that. You know, this next project is 10 different directors, 10 different stories um, in, in one location. And so we're going to be able, I think I'll be able to direct one of them. And, um, you know, we're going to get a slew of talented directors from, we have some great people involved, but we still have like um, five directors to hire so we want to get women and foreigners and, um, you know, we want to get a really good uh, eclectic mix of, of talent from around the world to, to make these stories. And I'll be one of them. I'm definitely going to direct an episode. Awesome. Yeah. So, Manu, when we talked about 10 months ago, things were just getting started on the circuit, but we've had 10 months between then and now. Can you tell me just a little bit about how your conception of the circuit has changed from then to now? Like, how, is, how has the idea been refined? Is there, you know, has the elevator pitch changed in any way? That kind of thing. Yeah, it's changed uh, incredibly. And we're actually uh, updating the website as we speak. It should be uh, completely updated next week. But originally, The Circuit was a sci-fi anthology film. And we were going to, you know, we were going to try to fit 10 stories into a film. And then when the screenplays started to get written and the fan base started to uh, submit their screenplays, we it became very obvious that this wasn't a film. It was a sci-fi anthology series. It was a television show. So um, it was also in the past, it was all going to take place over the weekend of a science fiction convention. And that's also gone out the window. Now it's um, all going to take place in a city called Erbiesa. And every year in Erbiesa, they happen to throw uh, the biggest science fiction 
convention and uh, pop culture convention on earth, if indeed Urbiesa is on earth. Um, but that's just a backstory. It's just one of the subtle ways in which we can tie some of these stories together with little spider like th threads. It's not the main focus of the series. So, you know, maybe one of these episodes might take place at that Omega Con convention, but mostly it's just a way to, you know, like a couple of the characters might be walking down the street in Urbiesa and you might see an Omega Con billboard from last year being torn down. And, and, you know, another story is happening in the same location 10 years later. And, you know, it's just a way to, it's not the focus of, of the series anymore. Um, we decided, I, I think it was probably after all the, the, uh, scripts came in. I then I watched Black Mirror. Have you guys seen Black Mirror, the the sci-fi anthology on Netflix? I saw the very first episode, and I I'm I was a bit like, what is this? I haven't watched any more yet. It was the Prime Minister one, so yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that's a very strange episode. <laughs> um, it's not much like the rest of the show. The Prime Minister one is like, yeah, it's like wow. Um, it's an, exp it's an explanation for that whole story about the prime minister uh, doing the naughty things to the pig. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know whether being British, like I saw that in a different way, but it was, yeah, it was a bit weird. <laughs> and so, but Dark Mirror really blew me away as far as um, the... Uh, it's a science fiction anthology. It's all completely different stories except they tie the stories together with time frame and technology. So a lot of the characters are using the same basic technologies. And I thought the show was so good. And then season four of Black Mirror got battled over by Netflix and Amazon. And they ended up getting like 5 million an episode to make season four. And I've, I realized that the circuit could be Black Mirror, but not as dark. Black Mirror is all dark science fiction. And so I thought we could do a science fiction anthology that could compete with Black Mirror in a sense by not having every episode be so dark. We could have, you know, a science fiction comedy, a science fiction romance, a science fiction musical, a science fiction drama. Um, we don't have to do all science fiction horror or science fiction that makes your stomach um, turn. I, I really enjoy Black Mirror because I love dark science fiction, but the circuit is basically Black Mirror meets like uh, Steven Spielberg's amazing stories. If you, you know, Black Mirror with some hope and some light. So I have kind of a, a multi-part question, uh, you know, as you were uh, talking, a few things came to mind. So one, one part is like what ties all the different stories together, but, but a deeper, a deeper question than that is, you know, coming out of the Star Trek tradition, I think, you know, it, it's likely plausible even that you, um, you know, inherited some of Gene Roddenberry's vision for how science fiction can change the world. So, you know, in what way is the circuit in the Star Trek tradition of, of, of having a message and a vision and not just being entertainment, but serving some sort of purpose? And one other part of the question is just like, why, why science fiction in general? What is it about science fiction that earlier you said that science fiction you think is the best vehicle for, um, you know, social change or telling certain kinds of stories, getting at certain human qualities, why science fiction in general? And then, and then interestingly, why, why, um, why conventions? What is it about the sort of idea of a popular culture slash science fiction convention that speaks to you? Of course, you've been on the convention circuit for a long time, <laughs> but, but what, what what, what about your own experiences about conventions has shaped your thinking in terms of the interesting types of stories to be told in that environment in particular? I'm going to go backwards because I, I remember the last part of the question first. You know, originally it was a convention movie and now it's, it's just a, a series and, and I, the convention is, I just, I held on to the Omega Con in Urbiesa, this, this city where all these stories take place because I've seen so many great stories happen behind the scenes at at pop culture science fiction conventions that I don't think the fans know happen. And there was no way that I wasn't going to show at least one episode 
about what happens behind the scenes that you guys don't know about. Um, so I, I didn't want to throw away the opportunity to do that. I am this, the second half of the question. Science fiction has the ability to be written um, since it's a, a genre that is so out there. It has the ability to, you can hide so many um, more intelligent metaphorical stuff underneath the surface of all that out there-ness stuff. I mean, if you make a drama that's not science fiction, then you're basically diving right at the heart of the issue. You're, you're just talking about whatever it is that you want to talk about. With science fiction, you can you can tell layered stories that are entertaining um, stories about one thing that at the same time are a metaphor for something completely different. Um, and you can, you can have layers to your themes because of the no rules. You know, you can have a time travel episode that takes place in several different dimensions and in all of that complexity, you can hide real simple themes. Um, and I, I think it's because of the, the no rules in science fiction that, that you have the ability to hide, you know, and, and I think it also has the ability to like, there are certain things that people are scared to talk about directly and science fiction gives you the, the ability to not directly talk about it, but still attack whatever it is, the, the social theme that you're attacking. Um, and the smart people get it. And then when the smart people get it, they explain it to the, the dumber folks. And when the, <laughs> the dumber folks get it, they explain it to the rest of the world too. So, And sometimes it feels like, you know, when you tackle an issue head on, sometimes the issues are so close that our, our prejudices and our biases and our gut reactions get in the way of clear thinking about it. So if, if you, you know, put people in funny makeup, put them on a spaceship, your intuitions can be drawn towards our better intuitions in that way than if you're tackling an issue so head on that people get emotionally charged about it. That's a great, that's a great point that, that you can, you can slide around people's biases without them throwing the wall up too quickly. I remember years ago, I, this might have been sometime around maybe the 25th anniversary of Star Trek. So we're talking a, a ways ago now. But I remember seeing an interview with Gene Roddenberry where someone asked him, are there really more stories to tell out in outer space? Like, hasn't science fiction kind of run its course? All the stories have been told. And it's a dumb question. And Gene Roddenberry basically said, oh, heavens no, there's a universe of stories to be told out there. So I I, yeah, I, I love that there's, you know, even though we've got this many years of Star Trek behind us and this many, you know, this long history of science fiction now, there's still stories to be told, stories that are small and interpersonal and, and appeal to people's uh, uh, emotions on a, on a real interpersonal level, you know, heart-based stories, and there's adventure stories to be told out there and everything in between. And we've only scratched the surface in terms of the number of stories to be told. So, so. Absolutely. And, and especially with Star Trek, I mean, Gene did it all from, you know, a crew on a spaceship. And, and I, I guess the, the biggest thing that I'm hoping is, you know, we've got like 23 or 24 or something like that uh, science fiction and, and fantasy actors involved with the circuit. And at least half of them are ex Star Trek cast from uh, different incarnations of Star Trek. And I hope that the fan base out there, I mean, I I'm seeing like uh, Ira and um, some friends of mine from deep space have this documentary for deep space going on Indiegogo right now. And they're almost at like a half a million dollars. At, um, and I'm thrilled for those guys and, and renegades, raised a half a million dollars and Axanar raised $1.5 million. And what a tragedy that was because that money should have gone to storytelling. Um, but I'm hoping that the, the Star Trek fan base is interested in seeing these actors that they know and love in a new format of science fiction. And I hope that they're just as excited about that as they are of of Star Trek. Um, I want to show, I guess what's most exciting about this project for me is that I get to work with all these people that I've met through Star Trek and I get to put them in situations and in characters that they've never gotten the opportunity to play before for the public and for me personally. 
you know, I, I love these guys and gals and I, I want to show the world what more, what else they have to offer besides the characters that they played on Star Trek. And I, I hope, I hope that the, the Star Trek fan base is excited about that as I am. And, um, the last thing about the circuit that is exciting and, and, um, fantastic for all of us involved uh, from the, the crew on down to the actors is that for every episode that, that we finance and, and hopefully we're just going to finance this pilot through the Kickstarter and sell the pilot to Amazon or Netflix or HBO and, and get the budget that we want. But for every episode that we do, we're going to bring on 10 people from around the world, fans, people that are passionate about filmmaking and, and, film quality television and bring them onto the set to work in whatever department they so choose. And so, and we're taking in submissions, you know, right now, if you go to Monuente Ramey at the circuit film.com, we're going to get this, um, to get an opportunity to work with people from all over the world and try to start a groundbreaking science fiction anthology series, not only with, you know, a list kick-ass professionals, uh, but with, hot filmmaking people f and fans uh, teaming up from around the world and we're going to do it together. Um, and if we pull that off, I think that'll be something really, really beautiful. So, And we should say when we're recording this, the Kickstarter is about to start in about three days from the day we're recording this, right? Is that right, Mark? No, or, no, no. Is that it, wrong? Did I have it wrong? It doesn't start till April. Hey, that's okay. We decided to push it a few weeks because mm -hmm. we have a list of, we're trying to get the list to 2,500 uh, people that are promising to pledge sort of like the circuit sci-fi family, the, the sci-fi army of pledgers. And we need 900 more emails. And with the way that, that people have been, it's, we're starting to build some real traction and the way that those emails have been coming in, we figure we need about three more weeks to hit that number. So um, plus April, I, I'm executive producing and April is my birthday month. So it made sense to do it then. Mine too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm already on the list. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for joining us. I, I, it's really actually, it's really exciting because I mean, we, we already have enough people. I think we could launch now and be successful, but I, I want to be really successful. And I want this show to, to be a film quality show. I, I don't want to be a, um, you know, a, a web series that doesn't have enough money to shoot what, what we want to shoot. So, um, we're just going to, we're going to wait till we get the right number and the math breaks down to 2,500 people. So that's what we're going for. This is something I was thinking about before we started recording today, that this is a very 21st century way of making making a film. I mean, think about all, I mean, you mentioned the, the network and the relationships you have with, with other actors and producers and directors, people you've known throughout your career. You have a set of relationships with you know, with uh, fans you've encountered and come to know over the, over the years. And it, the technology exists now to put all of that together into some massive creative force and, you know, make good use of people's talents, put people where they can be used, let people people get involved in ways they couldn't be be involved before. How, how do you find the balance between inclusiveness, wanting to include as many voices as possible to really make a, a genuinely 21st century collaborative production, but still keep that quality really high at that bar that you just described? Well, I've been in the business for 20 years. And so our core group of, um, uh, of, of crew, uh, you know, is, really, really solid. Um, you know, I have Mike Phillips and his buddies from Radical 3D, Jason McKinley and Jason Newfield, who have worked on Iron Man 2 and Star Wars Rogue One and The Wall, and they do top-notch uh, CGI. And, you know, to pay them for a CGI shot per shot would usually be about five to $20,000, depending on what kind of uh, shot they were doing. But because they're my friends and because I've known them for so long and they like the project, they're, they're not going to charge me nearly even a, you know, like a 5% of, of that. So um, we have just a really, really strong small crew that we're going to add talent to. Um, and I think in that way, we'll, we'll keep cohesion and, and we'll keep quality and then we'll, 
find uh, fans and, and passionate filmmakers out there to just bring even more uh, to the table when, when we bring them on board. And when's your birthday, by the way, in April? What, 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 what's the date? It's the 15th. The 15th. So are you still a Taurus? Aries. Aries. See? Okay. I'm, I'm seven days later, so I, I slip into Taurus. Uh, I, I got another question that I have, actually, tying together a few different things that you've said. I've noticed, that obviously, on the circuit, as you mentioned, you've got a lot of Star Trek people on there, and on other projects that you've worked on, you've got quite a lot of Star Trek people. Is that because you feel like the people who've been in Star Trek have a similar outlook to you in terms of what they want to do, in the sense that they want to produce something that means something? Yeah, and they're all excited to do something different. You know, we we, we all have that, like that catch 22 of like, you know, we were a part of this big, big, beautiful franchise and we're humble and thankful and amazed. And we're very lucky to be a part of it, but also, you know, it was, it was 16 years ago and it's still what I'm known for and, and what we're all known for. And we want to show the world something new, but they're also just my friends, you know, and I like working with people that I know are, are talented and that I get along with. And, I also want to, I want to mess around with them in a sense and, and pull, you know, I want to see Robert Picardo play a, a girl and, um, you know, I want to, I want to see, I want to show people the range that these actors have that I, I don't think people know. Um, and certainly uh, I cast them because and I will work with them um, over and over again because uh, I love them, but also because they're, especially on the circuit, I'm working with a bunch of people that I, I've never worked with before. Um, you know, Terry Farrell and, uh, oh, Doug Jones. I haven't worked with Doug Jones. He was in Fifth Passenger, but I, I didn't get to work with him. But yeah, they they, they know they're, they're all Roddenberryites. You know, they, they know the power of science fiction to tell uh, powerful theme. And so when they come on board, they also sort of push me to make sure that my writers and, and the stuff that I'm writing um, and the stuff that the fans are writing is, is up to, up to stuff. You know, they, they, they push me to make sure that I don't want to let them down and they don't want to let me down. And so that it's also a way of keeping the quality high. I've been really fortunate in my own career. I've worked with, in some cases, the same kind of group of people for between 10 and 20 years in some cases. Now it's amazing. And there's something to be said for just keeping the band together. Like, you know, with a certain group of people, you're going to do good work. You're going to have fun doing it. It's going to be great no matter what you end up doing. But I hear you describe something like a, like a challenge to yourself. Like you think that Star Trek stuff was great 15 years ago. Wait till you see what we're going to do now. We're going to blow your blow your socks off. Yeah, we're gonna wow people. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna blow people's minds, and we're gonna rip their hearts out at the same time. And I don't mean in a violent way. I mean we're gonna plug at people's heartstrings. We're gonna we're gonna really affect people's emotions. And uh, that's that's the the type of television, good film quality television, um, that I want to make is is the stuff that that I see that that you walk out or you after you see the episode or after you see the film, you're emotionally shaken up in some way, shape or form. Um, and you feel more connected to your, your fellow human beings. And, and that's, that's the kind of stuff you want to make and I want to make, and they want to make, and we want to make, and it's, uh, it's easier said than done. You know, you can, you can very easily when you're trying to make, um, quality uh, media like that to slip into cliche. And one of the also things that I, the, the, in the way that we've built the circuit, most of the crew, the, the DP and the, the CG guys and the sound guys and the, the gaffers and the, the director of photography, the cinematographer, all those guys are friends that I've met through other um films and independent cinema and other shows that I've been on. And none of them really are Star Trek guys. Um, so it's a lot of them are Star Trek fans. Um, I think most people are when it comes down to it, but um, 
not you know we've got we've got star wars people involved in this too so there'll, there'll be a little bit of uh, uh <laughs> you know forcing those that camp to work together is going to be fun too a little bit of friendly rivalry <laughs> yeah if if people out there are interested in the, in, in the circuit and they want to join the 2500 uh email list people sci-fi family that we want to Make sure the the plan is to have twenty five hundred people that are willing to pledge right from the get go on the first three days. So we smash through our our first goal, and then we attract some press, and this blows up into a big big thing. So if they want to join the email list, you can contact me at the Manu Entereme at the Circuit Film dot com at Manu Manu Entereme on Facebook and Twitter, or at the circuit movie on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and just send us your emails. And if you want to be a part of the film and a part of the production, submit your reels, your whatever department you want to be involved in. If you're just getting into the business and you are just passionate, just write me a letter, tell me who you are, show me a picture of yourself, um, and submit to Monuente Reme at the circuitfilm.com. I, what I've seen, Manu, I mean, I, I've known you for a while now. You know, we interact on social media sometimes, and I've been following the circuit behind the scenes and keeping up a little bit. What, I, what I've observed, and this is this is to your credit, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned um, kind of like the, the good, kind, Icheb, like the best version of Manu, and then the evil, dark Manu that lurks behind the behind, under the surface. But I, what I've seen you use, I've seen you use your personality to rally support. You know, you've kept a network of people from your career that are willing to show up and work, and like you like you said in some cases give you a discount on their services even you know because they like you and and i think the we as fans like interacting with you and i and i get the sense you genuinely appreciate the people you work with and the people who want to interact and be involved and and just be a part of the like you said like you described it as a, a one big science fiction family you know that's how i think of it i think that's how you think of it and i've seen you use that to get something accomplished well that's the magic of 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 what Star Trek started. I mean, Star Trek started the science fiction convention for the most part. I mean, I know there were science fiction conventions that were literary before Star Trek, but you know, it definitely began the, 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 the conventions that became now what they are, which is like, they're crazy. Now they're, they're, they're mega cons there and they're people that love everything from science fiction to fantasy to superhero to, you know, it's just entertainment conventions now for, you know, um, and the, you can't, I mean, if you aren't conscious of how important, um, people that your work hasn't, haven't, have inspired and, and how important they can be back in return to you, um, you're, you're kind of a, a schmuck. Um, you know, I, I'm looking at you now, Zach, and you've got a, a just an awesome vibe about you. I don't, I mean, I can't see any sort of like devious uh, Zach. And he must exist somewhere. He's down in there. I guarantee it. But yeah, you, I mean, you seem like just a, a really, really good human being. And I, I don't know. I think people don't understand how important the smallest of of actions are, you know, um, a dollar donation to uh, a project and then a share on your social media page to go check out what we're trying to get done here can affect a hundred people or a thousand people. And then those thousand people can affect a thousand more. And when we actually get together, I actually saw that, you know, this magic thing, um, when it was a great example of it, you could feel it in the room. I think, I don't, I don't know if I told, told you this on your show last time. I don't think so. Um, but Adam Nimoy did a film for his father for the love of Spock. And he, uh, l like the circuit, he put the people that donated to the project up in the credits at the end of the film. And I got to see that film in at the Egyptian theater in front of a loaded, um, you know, it was a packed house and at least a third of the people there, if not more were people that had donated and chipped in to the project in some way, shape or form. And then to see all their names go up across the screen at the end and to know that this whole crowd of people 
were responsible for this beautiful film of a uh, that was that was an ode to a man who's given us so much. Um, Leonard was such an amazing person, and and he was also the kind of guy that would literally, no matter who you were, would listen to you and be generally interested in in what you had to say or what you were thinking, and then somehow had the ability to then say something back to you that was enlightened almost always and taught you something. He was just um, an amazing human being. And to be a part of just donating to that film and then watching that film and seeing seeing it with people that, that had supported it, it's, it was breathtaking. You know, it was, it's a really good feeling when people get together and, and, and make something happen that um, is communal and, and collaborative. And um, I want to be a part of that more than, more than, more than anything right now, you know, I, I am, and, and no, nobody has really done the, uh, you know, not only do we want you to donate to this project and pledge to this project, but we want you to come work with us and come get paid and, and show us what you got. Um, I think that's really exciting. And, and some of the actors are, you know, just as excited as, as I am about who we're going to bring on and what kind of experience that's going to be, you know. A little while ago, we talked about science fiction being a metaphor. And what I'm hearing here is, is this is, again, a metaphor for life. I mean, we're talking about making a movie, which in the grand scheme of things itself is not the most important thing on the planet. But it's a testament for what can happen when people come together. People give a little money. They give a little bit of their time. They donate some of their talents. Put it all together. Give it some time and some energy and some optimism. And great stuff can happen. And all of life is like that. You know, when, when good people come together and decide to get something done, they totally have the power to do it. And and for, for me personally, coming from education, having been an instructor and now working in, in content development for education, I get frustrated because I see the educational system not working and people at, at large out there in our country, in the world, being fatalist, not being inspired, not being the best versions of themselves, having a narrow vision. I just want, I, I feel like, you know, that system has not, has not solved the problem of, of helping people develop a vision for what they can accomplish in life. So, you know, combine good education with a good dose of, you know, science fiction optimism, put people together and get them inspired and let's get some stuff done. I, it's, it's just amazing. I think all that, what you've just described is a metaphor for all of life for me. For all of life, absolutely. If you're not if you're not on the positive side of things, you're on the negative side of things. And and with the way things are going right now, we don't have uh, the luxury of being um, cynical. We just don't. I, um, it's 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 time to uh, go out and do what we can every day. Um, and on a person to person basis too. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I love you know. There's so much of a of a split. Um, between the nation right now, between um, this this Trump guy and and um, the other half of us, uh, but it's it's more complicated than that, you know. And I always think that that people that are lost in negativity are still really lovable people. And if you have the patience, and that's also why science fiction can can sneak around their you know their their walls if you have the patience to to just keep talking to them and 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 educate as well as have your mind open to learn from from where they're coming from um I, you can do really magic things if you, if you don't slip into that that lizard brain as she was saying earlier that that ego place that oh i'm right and you should just shut up uh where Things become name calling, and then it's all over. Wait, this is this is a Voyager podcast. We don't do we don't have a lizard brain. We have a lizard lizard baby's brain. Lizard baby's brain. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm pointing at her. She's not, she's like no no. <laughs> Let it never be said. I don't take the easy jokes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and I really feel like media has a huge part to play in in leading people's attitudes and changing people's attitudes. And sometimes I think it's very easy to go, oh, it's just a movie or it's just a TV show. But I think that it can be so much more than that. Did you guys see Moonlight? 
I haven't seen no, it yet, yet, but go see it Moon. was so, so amazing. Oh my God. So amazing. You know, one of those films that every breath, uh, was, it, it was shot so perfectly and it's such a beautiful story and it's such a story outside the norm of, you know, where on this program, we got four white people. Uh, I don't think anybody here, it looks like lives in the inner city. Um, but this, this, this movie is about love, bottom line, and um, breaks so many taboos. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a gay film, but it's not a cliche gay cinema. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. And the fact that a four million dollar indie film that probably a bunch of people got together that believed in something um, and made won the Oscars over a hundred and eighty million dollar film um, uh, is amazing to me and beautiful. And if you haven't seen Moonlight yet, please check it out. And like Kay was saying, um, you can't, you know, life is yin and yang, right? You've got, you can say, ah, it's just a movie. It doesn't, it's not really big in, in the, the grand scheme of things. But you can say the complete opposite. You can say it's a movie and it affected millions of people and it, millions of people or even thousands of people that's attitude was changed for the better for that day can leave a huge wake for that year or that month or, you know, going forward into the future. And, and like um, uh, Zach was saying, we build, we build our reality by these things. And uh, the more of us that go forward positively leaving, leaving cool things in our wake instead of negative things, um, the better chance we have of at the, the beginning of the show of waking up and treating each other better someday and breaking out of this fear baby lizard brain programming that we uh, that we get stuck in all the time and i think this is what i really love about the century that we live in you know i you know i'm about the same age as you manu i'm 38 i'll be 39 this year and you know i've seen the world transition from a world where you have to go to the library and pull card catalogs out and if you want to make something it's really 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 expensive to the point yeah. where um, like you described a movie that cost a fraction of the amount of movie to make as the other movies can change the world it can win an oscar and change the world and it's it's an amazing tool and people just don't think of the power they have to promote change around them to help people be better to inspire someone you know people are just busy going to work and paying their bills and you know if they're lucky they're paying their bills these days but you know they they have this yeah. such amazing tools that other people took the time to invent that are like in their pockets and on their desktops you know computers and cell phones and you know cheaper cameras whatever it takes to get stuff made like we can we can put all this stuff together and literally change the world around us by inspiring people and what's cool too is like like I'll I'll share with you a little bit about uh, Fifth Passenger and how we got that finished. You know, filmmaking still is an an, an expensive thing to to get right. Uh, I think uh, some people on Kickstarter and in the crowdfunding world think you can make things um, like what's his name? He uh, amazing what he did. Um, that kid that made the the recent Star Trek um, film in his garage. Horizon, I think it was called. I think he made that for like thirty, forty thousand dollars. But then people don't realize that he spent like five years and had all his buddies and <laughs> all that time and all that knowledge. You know, he he took on all those different jobs. Um, but I mean, one of the, the amazing thing about Fifth Passenger is, and I'm rambling, but we have to get through to. You said it was hard to pay your bills these days. We have to get through somehow with the arts to the rich to get their levels of empathy up. And I don't mean every rich person on the planet. There's definitely a lot of people out there that are rich that are doing wonderful things for society. But um, when you get a, a bunch of um, people together that aren't necessarily rich – what was neat about the way fifth passenger happened was we raised a little less than a hundred thousand dollars on Indiegogo and kickstarted to get that off the ground. The movie ended up costing significantly more than that. Um, not quite a million dollars, but 
significantly more than we raised. But because of that little chunk that the fan base gave, we were able to go talk to rich people <laughs> and, and say, hey, we have this much, will you match it? And we were able to raise a whole lot more money um, because we got right over that hump. And, and with producing indie film, once you have about a hundred grand, you're, people take you seriously. Uh, other production entities and other people um, in Hollywood or in entertainment, they realize, okay, here's a team. They've got a trailer. They've got a script. They're, they're obviously professionals and they're willing to risk a hundred thousand dollars. And then, so you can, you can go find uh, other people that are higher in the income bracket to, to help you out and, and raise money. Uh, so. I guess that's a good segue into, into a, another question I had, like what advice would you give to either aspiring filmmakers? And again, this is like a metaphor for life. It's not just about making films, right? Someone who wants to get something done, you can't get things done without money. It takes money to make a movie. It takes money to start a business, it takes money to do whatever, but you, you were able to parlay that, you know, a hundred thousand dollars into, into a million dollars by getting other people to match it. How, how, you know, people who want to get things done, what advice would you give them? You know, whether it, again, you know, filmmaking in a narrow sense, but you know, uh, any other project they want to pursue in life. Writing in a, a book, sense. building a house, exactly. uh, whatever. Uh, get over the fear. Get over all those, well, that won't work for me. Uh, I can't do that. Uh, all that self-doubt. Just tell it to shut up. Um, you know, you have, to, for instance, I, I can only talk about things from my reality, but if you're an actor, it's very hard to get um into high quality productions without a high quality agent. Um, but then how do you break down the doors of high quality agencies, right? Agencies basically don't let you submit to them. They have a closed door policy unless you have a manager that they trust to submit to them. There's all these like roadblocks that they try to put up. To And what they really are doing is they're just trying to weed out the people that are scared and just have the, have the, uh, the strength to get over those fears and go challenge those roadblocks. I mean, what, what's the worst that can happen? They're going to say, no, walk into that office building and tell them re research whoever you want to talk to find out where it's very easy to find out where people are that you want to speak to and have the belief in yourself that you can initiate change. And once you have that, you can convince others. And so step one is to, to get over your own fear and your own inadequacies and believe that you can do something as, as well as, as anyone else can. Um, and uh, educate yourself. Like, you, you know, if you, if you were talking about filmmaking, filmmaking is an, an incredible, um, and, and television, uh, it, it's all film. Um, actually, it's all digital media these days, but uh, it, it's, it's an art form that involves every other art form. You know, um, there, there isn't an art you can think of on planet Earth that isn't in filmmaking. So educate yourself on software, uh, cameras, um, as much as you can learn about anything, spend the time to either take the classes. I don't know if this is the right word, but I think it's an autodidact. Is that someone that's able to teach themselves things through maybe? Uh, so, you know, if you're able to, to do that, grab a book, you know, uh, learn to the point where you're confident enough about what you're talking about to then go find the people you need to help you um, succeed in whatever endeavor you're, you're choosing to do. But mostly it's about conquering that fear and, and getting the knowledge and the know-how uh, is a, one of the best ways to conquer. 
you know, there's like two parts to it. There's overcoming your fears and being confident enough to put yourself out there. Because if you're afraid of doing that, you're never going to get anything done. You're just going to stay no. in your little box. So you got to overcome those fears, but also be humble enough to know what you don't know. We know that you still have yeah. something to learn. And almost no one will say no if you really genuinely ask them for help. People really do want to share their experience and their expertise, but people are afraid to ask. So the people who have all this knowledge and experience don't get asked the questions because people are afraid to talk to them. Yeah, and so it's really awesome for them like when somebody has the uh, strength to go up to Guillermo del Toro and say, hey, how did you build this? Is there any chance that you could show me? You know, chances are he might be like, yeah, I could do that, you know. Um, and how, I'll bet you that conversation doesn't happen very much. No, because people are too, too scared to ask for a mentor. Um, and I think, you know, um, you, that's, that's my advice to, to young filmmakers, old filmmakers, anybody. It's don't be afraid to ask for what you want. And, um, yeah, don't be afraid to admit what you don't know. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, the only stupid question is the one that you don't ask and you pretend that you know it. And when you don't know the answer to it, um, cause people will see that coming a mile, a million miles away. If you're the, the old fake it till you make it thing is, is not my, um, I don't recommend that one at all. I, I recommend being completely who you are and, um, learning as much as you can and, and asking for as much as advice as you can along the way. Well, if you're faking it, reality has a way of catching up before too long. Yeah. So we talked a lot about the circuit. This this is a Voyager podcast. <laughs> so I, I want to make sure that Suzanne and Kay have a chance to ask all their questions too. So so Suzanne and Kay, is there any, anything else you'd like to ask about Voyager? I love talking about Voyager. Whether Voyager, Echeb? I want to ask actually, um, if, you, if you could have picked any story or storyline for Echeb, what would it have been? What would you have liked to see happen to him or what, what would you have liked to see him face on the show? I really wanted to do, and I even let the writer's room know, and I let Brian Fuller know at the time, and Jerry Taylor. Jerry Taylor, I believe, invented uh, the E-Chip character. I let them all know that I wanted to do uh, a Fairhaven episode or a um, an episode in the holodeck where E-Chip could be somebody completely unlike his very robotic, stiff self. I wanted him to be able to laugh and to be, I wanted to do something completely different with him, you know, get to experience uh, emotion and, and show, you know, get him to play a villain or just anything. I just wanted to get a holodeck episode. It never happened. And I was bummed that it, it didn't, but that, that was my, my dream. I'm picturing each and captain proton now. Yeah. In a captain proton episode, I would have loved to have gotten to do one of those. That was, those were fun, but he wouldn't play the robot. He would have to play an interesting character. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, was Satan robot, robot Satan or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would have been, that would have been awesome. We love, we love a holodeck episode. So yeah, yeah they I, were fun. Liked to see that. I was really hoping for, I think one came along during, uh, the season, I think book two came along during the seasons that I was in, but they didn't write me into them, so I was bummed. Well, along the lines of there are no stupid questions, here on To The Journey, we have a an idea of how Voyager came up with all these different torpedoes and all these different shuttlecrafts because they kept, you know, crashing. Our thought is that Chakotay whittled new shuttlecrafts and new torpedoes Things like that. Anything they needed, Chakoti was out there in his woodworking shop just taking care of it. So, along those lines, <laughs> if Chakoti. Well, he made Captain Janeway a bathtub, right? <laughs> yes, he did. So, along those lines, if each could have asked Chakoti to whittle him something, what would it have been? If each would get to whittle him something. And that is a question you only get asked on to the journey. That's for sure. There's going to be like 20 minutes of silence while I come up with a decent answer for this. Um, I know, I know. I, the The answer is easy. Um, a girlfriend. <laughs> Each have never, you know, he he never had an opera. You know, he had that fun episode where he thought that Bolana was in love with him but he, he never got an, a chance to experience any sort of um, uh, romantic 
love. So yeah, I would have had uh, him even even like a a robot pal that I could learn from <laughs> or something, um, a, a a Borg lady, um, or or whittle me the 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 sort of um, a better intellect for my Borg brain so that I could come on to seven. Um, that that would have been nice too. <laughs> She was my mother figure on the show, so I had that difficult thing of like being super attracted to Jerry Ryan, and at the same time, as an actor, going, "This is this is your mom. This is your mother. This is your mother." And that's how I sort of like um, stopped myself from being um, full of fear about you know, acting with such a beautiful lady. I had no idea the Borg were susceptible to the Oedipus complex. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Especially with seven of nine, and she was such a cool lady. I mean, Jerry was so much, so much fun. And at the same time, I was twenty-one and just loaded with hormones, and she was a blast. And and she was dating um, Brandon Braga at the time, Sue. So I couldn't even flirt, you know, or I'd get fired. Um, but no, it was it, it was great working with her and. Yeah, a, a girlfriend. He was a lonely. Each of was lonely. Well, she would have had to have been like well sanded, so no splinters. You don't want splinters. Yeah, yeah, no, no splinters. Just, just <laughs> a, somebody to, to talk at, <laughs> or whittle off of... some of my nose. Maybe, <laughs> you know, a better nose. Hashtag Chicote's razor. <laughs> yeah. Just, so it just. I thought the eyepiece was so cool, but the the schnoz was like. <laughs> really messed with your depth perception. And also when you have something that's like two fingers long on your nose, it very often attracts your eyes to it. And so as an actor, you're, you're constantly trying not to cross your eyes. That was uh, the most difficult time I had on that show that I can think of. Look, not looking at my nose during takes. Um, kind of a, kind of a related question to what I was asking about, about what you'd have liked to see Teb do on the show. Um, how do you think he would have coped with getting back to earth and where do you think he would have gone afterwards? I think it was written into the, the, the text. Uh, I mean, into the script, um, pretty plainly that he was going to join, uh, Starfleet when he got back, um, of course, you know, the, the ego always thinks Captain Ichab someday. Um, and why not? He was a boy genius with the a virus built into his bloodstream to fight the Borg. What, what a perfect candidate for a captain. So I think he was going to join Starfleet and go as far as uh, the universe would let him go. I don't know how much you know about the novel series that continues on after the end of Voyager, but Echeb turns out pretty awesome. Really? And in, in what ones? What novels? So there's a whole series of novels that continue from the end of Voyager, um, written by two different authors. Um, but yeah, Echeb turns out to be uh, to be pretty cool in those. So one of them is a a, a woman, right? They're both women, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Will you send me uh, just the name of the, the authors and a couple sure. of the books? Because I've always meant to take a look at the fiction, um, and, and I never have. I mean, I'm an avid reader, and I just, I, I've just i always meant to do that and never gotten around to it. So. Actually, one of, the, um, one of the authors who's still, the one who's still writing them currently, um, Kirsten Beyer, she's actually writing on the new Star Trek series as well, so... Oh, cool. So she's, uh, she's writing in the writer's room for Discovery, too? Yeah, she is, yeah. Sweet. I know I keep asking these meta-level questions, but to me, it's really interesting. I mean, you brought a character to life. You only played it, you know, each ep- or for a few episodes. But for better or worse, you became the character. You know, you, you know the mannerisms, of the, the way people think of that character by name is your portrayal of it. So when someone writes a novel or a story about Ichab, there's there's got to be a part of you that, that takes some pride in that because people have in mind you when they read that. They don't, you know, your face, your mannerisms, your portrayal, and it's not you, the person, but there's, there's, there's a a residue, for lack of a better word, of your portrayal that, that bleeds into all this other creative work. Yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely proud and and humble and thankful and um 
it's, when I when I take the time every now and again and, and watch the the old episodes on Netflix and and I'm someone asked me in Germany uh, um, last year um, was there anything about your performance you would have changed and the answer was no I I played him perfectly <laughs> like. <laughs> I, I was I I'm really good in that series. I did a really you know I was very proud of the work that I did on that show. I, I took it very seriously. I I worked my my butt off to get it right. And um, I think that all in all, the with the with the good writing that that came about, and there were just enough. I think there was 13 episodes that I did, 11 that made 11 that I that made the screen. Um, there was just enough that you got a really solid idea of, of, you know, who this person was. And, um, it is definitely neat that he's survived into the books and, um, it was even fun, you know, even though he's very, very different in the, the, this, uh, web series, this goofy web series, Renegades, it's still beautiful. And I, I still enjoyed, um, I, I enjoyed putting his skin back on for that thing too. And it was just neat to work with Walter too in the last one. And, and um, that was sort of, uh, you know, getting on Star Trek to begin with was this sort of fascinating surreal dream come true. But then getting to work with Walter, one of the original cast members was also like, and then getting to know him on top of it. Was, it's all been awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about that? About that, because I think it's it's been sad to see as the years go on and we lose cast members, you know, from the original series, and and eventually we'll all be there, right? So, but you know, we're we're on the transition from you know living people that we know and have relationships with to these people will be dead and gone eventually, and it's sad to say, but you know, time is marching on. What is there anything you can share about your experience with Walter in particular, or anyone in a in a similar situation that should become part of the record? Walter, um, I, I would say that there's something about Walter, George, and especially Nichelle Nichols. I have had moments with Nichelle Nichols that I don't know if it's just me or everyone around that woman. Um, and I'll get back to Walter because he's just as amazing. But I... When you when I'm around Nichelle Nichols and I'm I'm looking into her eyes the 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 few days that I've got to be present with her and I've got to talk to her or watch her, I sort of feel myself glowing. This woman has the ability to. When you talk about being a positive individual uh, that's always present, and she leaves a beautiful wake behind her. She is just gorgeous, um, and. I was in Hawaii recently and we were doing a panel 50th anniversary and Michelle Nichols was sitting on my right and Walter Koenig was on my left. And after the panel, a bunch of people came up to me and they said, Manu, do you know that you were glowing, that you were like glowing, but sitting between those two that you could see like beaming how happy that you were. And I was like, no, but I was certainly enjoying myself. Um, you know, Nichelle, I shared with her this moment that I watched. I was sitting behind her at San Diego Comic-Con when we were watching the uh, premiere of the last Star Trek film. And she was right in front of me. And every time she, she was with uh, this lady, I think her name's Kimberly. I don't remember, but this lady that is, that helps her. I don't know if it's her cousin or one of her uh, handlers or whatever. But she, every time Ohura on the screen would do something uh, neat or heroic or whatever, (laughs) Michelle would lean over and go, oh, look what I just did. (laughs) You know? (laughs) And watching that, I thought that was so beautiful to see (laughs) this character that she'd made and that she was still so connected to. She's like, look at me, look at me. You know? It was beautiful. And so I shared that with her on, on stage and it was a, a funny moment and she hugged me and she was talking about how she's this, this, this beautiful person. And, and she was talking about how Star Trek was such a gift to her life that, and she was, she was like spewing uh, graciousness and thanks. 
And they were all saying how, we were all answering the question, how has Star Trek affected your life? Um, and then I answered the question and then Walter answered the question. And Walter basically said, I'm, I'm basically a neurotic um, sort of self-centered uh, neurotic person that I was <laughs> when I got on Star Trek. And I'm still sort of a neurotic uh, old curmudgeon person. I'm just old now. But, and that's about it. But the honesty of that was just as beautiful as anything that Michelle said, you know, he was Walter, you know, and he's, he's, he's got this, you know, he's really got a heart of gold. He's a beautiful human being, but he puts up this wall of like, eh, yeah, Walter Koenig and whatever. And, and, um, <laughs> and I, I think he's truthfully just as, as kind and, and a, a beautiful and he'll wink at you you know walter way the walter's way of showing love is to like give you shit you know and then nudge and wink you know um is that where you got it (laughs) 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 um you know lately what should make the historical record is that walter's having a hard time keeping his jeans up over his bum lately and so he's walking around everywhere, kind of like rolling gangster style with his jeans down. And uh, the last couple conventions he's had that that I've been at, he's been rolling with his like gangster pants. And um, everybody gives him crap for it. And it's really fun to him to, to watch him get upset about it. And he's like, I, I just can't keep them up. I'm like, yeah, right. You know, you're rolling like, like the kids in the hood. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> you know it too. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen. I'm already there, you. man. I'm getting That's up there awesome. myself. Jeez, got to lose a few pounds. I'm having the same trouble. Yeah, yeah, me too, actually. No, but seriously though, I mean, it's. I would. I in a way, I'm really jealous. I would love to have the chance to pick their brains and just ask some of these deeper questions for them too. And you know, I'll, I, I get a chance to talk to some people, but not very much. I so part of these are like indirect questions. Like I want, I want to, you know, I want to channel them through you, and then eventually you'll be old, and someone else will have to channel you too. So you know, we have we have direct access to you now, but. Uh, you know, at some point we'll be like, oh, Manu's too old. He can't keep up. His pants are falling down. So we can't get him on the show anymore. <laughs> so while we're here, we got to pick your brain. Well, there's real uh, beautiful moments that, you know, I, I was conscious of that. I hope that people will look up to me when I'm old. Um, we'll see. Uh, but the, well, you know, one time uh, Robert Picardo told me that, hey, kid, when I was like 20, you got something and you, you, you woke us up on this show and, and thanks for coming on. You woke us all up. And, and that like floored me. I was so ecstatic. Uh, Cause I looked, looked up to him as an actor when I was it's still, I, I love his stuff. Um, and then I told Walt, I told Picardo like 10 years later, Hey, you know, you really lifted my spirits as an actor when you told me that and, and kept me going for all these years afterwards, because uh, as a young man, you, you told me I had something and, and made me believe it myself, you know? Uh, and then he told me a story about when he was younger, this, he was doing a play with Walter Matthau and Walter Matthau said, you know, Hey, the, tonight you woke me up on stage. You really gave me something and you've got something kid. And it, it's, it's sort of that pass it on if you can tradition. And uh, also uh, you, there was um one time I was standing on a, we were about to do a, a Hawaiian cruise trek and very simple, meaningless story, but I was standing on a deck uh, at, at a, on a hotel room. Um, there was a little party going on and I, I, it was the first time I'd met George Decay and I was smoking a cigarette. I was 24 or something, 25 and he gave me just a bunch of crap about what a terrible thing you're doing to your life. And, you know, you should drink wine. You should drink red wine. You should not smoke cigarettes. And Walter, I mean, I mean, uh, George giving me crap for, for smoking has, you know, I've since quit smoking. Uh, so I don't know how much credit I'm going to give to George Decay, but, um, and then he said, you know, you should come back to my room, have some wine. And I thought he was hitting on me, but he wasn't, of course, because Brad was there. Um, I just assumed. 
um, but then later on that cruise, I wrote a song uh, and I got a huge laugh out of George Decay. And that, that was a pleasant moment in my life too. Um, there was a, uh, I forget the lyric to the song, but of course it ended in, Oh my, and, you know, he, he belted out <laughs> laughing. And, um, you know, it, everybody on that show has been incredible. I haven't had any, any heart to hearts with, with, with Bill. Um, I've talked to Bill a few times, but nothing that should go in the historical record that I can think of. I'm just frankly amazed at the quality of your George Takei impersonation. Come back to my yeah. come back to my cabin and have some wine. You should drink wine. Manu, you should <laughs> come back to my cabin and have some wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. It's like we're talking to George. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a hard impression to do. It's, it's George Decay. It's okay to be Decay. <laughs> so now what I'm going to ask you to do, because you're now both Manu and George, uh-huh. um, if Manu could ask George a question, what would he ask? And then you have to also do George's answer as well. Uh, George, um, how do you get 9 million followers on Facebook, I would love uh, some advice on, on how to get my Twitter and Facebook followers up. Could you tell me um, just maybe a little advice? No. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to figure that one out on your own. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> But I basically did ask him that question once, and that was pretty much what I got. Get smarter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, kid, you're on your own. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, Manu, is there anything you're you're dying to uh, chat about that we haven't haven't chatted about? We want to we want to make good use of your time, but we want to uh, you know we'll take as much of your time as you want to give us too. So you know, there's a lot of stuff coming out this year. I got to do this new western. I got to work with Luke Hemsworth. Um, it was really cool to meet him. I uh, hope to work with him some more. I, I just got to do a movie called Diverted Eden, and I got to be a, a bad guy. And it was a, a, the first time that I got to do a lot of really gnarly stunt work. Uh, I was shooting AK 47s out of um, like uh, SUVs driving down the street, and five different motorcycles shooting at guns, shooting guns back at us, and car crashes and crazy stuff. Um, th- that was really exciting and also terrifying. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that this show being about, you know, um, the positivity and, and people connecting. And uh, I, like, I like that this show is, is uh, uh, a little bit into the meta and the metaphysical and the spirituality. Um, I think we should just keep it that way. What? Well, they know I would have gray hair. We started with showing them the... The true gray coming. I was going to ask about that. Is that is that the real gray or is that dyed gray? Yeah, is, that's, is the that's, real deal? that's me, man. Ah, you know we're the same age. I got a few. I got a little bit coming in here, but you're you're. I, full I started on going point. gray it at looks 19. Good. Thank you. I, I. Yeah, you're rocking it. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's. I actually think that it's the catalyst for this latest work, and um, it's a new look, and uh, hopefully it'll it'll bring on some new things. It's got to be like putting on a new costume. It's got to change your persona a little bit. Well, it was wild to me because I, I like I said, I started growing gray when I was 19 and I, I started noticing it, but then I just dyed my hair for 19 years. And then one, you know, one day I was like, you know what, I'm just going to shave my head and let this grow in and see what it looks like just to, just to own up to how old I was and just to see really what I looked like, you know, instead of the fake uh, persona that I'd been putting on for, for Hollywood for 20 years. And, and I actually really like it. So I'm keeping it. You know, it's funny. I didn't realize when I was teaching, I started to realize uh, about myself that I'm a little bit theatrical. I never would have said that about myself in my first 25 years, but, <laughs> but like when I grow a beard or put a, you know, grow a goatee or even if I get, get a little bit of gray, it changes my personality. It becomes a, a type of caricature of myself. For sure. For sure. Be careful who you pretend to be because in the end, who you pretend to be is who you are. 
that's a uh, old Vonnegut quote, but yeah, you, it, that is the subtlest little things. Straight up 20th century existentialism there. You are what you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, for too long, you know, you play a creepy goatee guy for too long. All of a sudden you are that creepy goatee guy. <laughs> I, d- I didn't know we were getting Mirror Universe Manu into Rayme today. Yeah. But... <laughs> uh, that would have been fun too. That would I would like to have seen a Voyager episode with with Evil Echeb. I would that would have been Yeah, fun. that would have been fun. You know, since since Voyager, I've gotten to play a lot of uh, villains and I don't know. I I, I like playing villains. I, I I really enjoy getting to to go there um without repercussion. Uh at the same time, like villains can also be really cheesy if they're written poorly. So it's all about, you know, hopefully down the road um, with the circuit and, and with um, the acting career, um, we get to, we get to do some roles that I think with, with the gray too, I've gotten an opportunity recently to start playing a few more men uh, instead of boys. And I, I, I always had this baby face that, you know, I'm, I'm, almost 40 and and i i i still end up playing these very like boyish characters and um i think the gray is going to help me transition into getting to play some men finally (laughs) that whittled girlfriend will help with that as well what's that (laughs) the whittled one yeah yeah (laughs) so manu do you want to let our listeners know how they can contact you if they want to talk to you about the circuit or anything else that we've talked about today I'm very easy to find, Monuente Reme at Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Facebook, also, I have a fan page that I answer all my questions at, at Monuente Reme123. And if you want to contact the Circuit Movie and get involved, you can contact me at any of those places or at the Circuit Movie on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram or at Monuente Reme at the Circuit Film.com. Manu, I just want to say how great it is to have a chance to talk again. We talked quite a few months ago. We had a great conversation back then. I love talking with you. I feel like we always dig deep and get to the heart of something real when we talk. So I really enjoyed the conversation. And I know everyone here at Trek FM thinks of you as a friend of the network. So thanks for coming on and joining us. And we want to have you back. And you know, maybe next time bring, a, bring George or Nichelle or, uh, or Walter with you. Yeah, that'd be great. And, you know, a month from now, we're going to be doing, uh, you know, we're going to be doing 10 hard weeks of, of social media for the circuit. So um, I'd love to be back. And uh, anybody on the network that wants to have me or some of the cast um, contact me, I'd, I'd love to come back. Nice talking to you, to you three. Love you guys. And uh, see you down the road. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, this Thank was a great so conversation. I, no, I, I meant that. I feel like we always get to the heart of something real when we talk. You know, we, we do do this deep dive into, into the way we wish the world could be. And it can, you know. Yeah, We're very that, young. We're very young. It can't be this way. We just got to put our heads together and make it happen. Yeah. yeah. We're just getting started, which is another thing that, you know, Roddenberry said. We're a young species. We've got a long way to go, but we'll get there. Well, it's been really fun talking to Manu this week, but this isn't the only thing we've been doing on Trek FM. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek.fm, Standard Orbit. My casting choices, okay, would be for Ruck, you got to go with Dave Bautista, right? Uh, He's uh, Drax in Guardians of the Galaxy. He played Jinx in... uh, Yeah, Inspector. Yeah, what's that, Jinx? What's his name? Hinks, Mr. Hinks. Hinks. Yeah, Mr. Hinks. That's the wrong James Bond film, everybody. (laughs) The 602 Club. Going back to the Gotham thing really quickly, I know this is semi-derailing. Um, why would you want to move to Gotham? I mean, he has to have been there. It's like the picture that he has on his wall is this beautiful, shining, like, daytime view, if I'm not mistaken, of Gotham, which I don't think we ever see. Um, it was like, I'm not really sure. Charm City looks quite nice. <laughs> like so. Saturday Morning Trek. It's very much like a continuation of the original series. You know what? You raise a very good point, and it's one we probably should have talked about earlier, is that we talk so much about the animation and the limitations of the medium that we forget about the writing. And overall, it's pretty strong throughout the run. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out these shows and find out what we're talking about in your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button. That helps us out a lot. 
and it makes it easier for other listeners to find the show as they search iTunes. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and of course, you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website and grab the RSS link as well. Now, this has just reminded me... Another way you can help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week is to become a patron of the network on Patreon. If you visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm, you'll find our current goals and different milestone contribution levels, along with all of the great perks we have for you. These perks include early access to content, exclusive content, producer credits, seats in our content development team, and many more. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd like to take this moment to thank a few people. Firstly, the founder and publisher of Trek FM, C. Brian Jones. Our executive producers, Matthew Rushing and Kenneth Tripp. Aaron Harvey, our art director. Richard Marquez, our production manager. And Brandon Shea-Matella, our Patreon manager. We'd also like to thank our associate producers, Bruce Lish, Ju Kim, and Norman Lau. And don't forget to check out Enterprise in Space, a project of the nonprofit National Space Society. Visit enterpriseinspace.org to find out more and to get your seat on the mission. And check out Audible.com, offering more than 150,000 titles for your desktop or mobile device. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. If you have a question or comment on this episode or any other episode of To The Journey, head on over to trek.fm slash contact and leave us a message. While you're there, you could also leave us a voicemail. Just look on the sidebar of our To The Journey show page or go to speakpipe.com slash trekfm. You can find Trek FM on Twitter, at Trek FM. We're also on Facebook, facebook.com slash Trek FM. While you're on Facebook, check out the Babel Conference. Just type the Babel Conference into the search field, that's B-A-B-E-L, or go to our website at trek.fm and click Discussion on the menu bar. We also invite you to leave a rating and review of To The Journey on iTunes. We'd love to hear your feedback and suggestions for the show. Kay, where can people find you on the interwebs? Well, you can find me on a recent episode of Earl Grey. Had fun on there with Richard and Lee talking about growing up in the UK as a Trekkie. You can also find me in the Babel Conference. And if you want to look me up on Twitter, my handle is Choco Weeble. Zachary, where can people find you on the interwebs? Well, you can find me elsewhere on Trek FM as co-host of Metatrex, Trek FM show on Star Trek and philosophy. And speaking of Metatrex, we did an episode with Manu some time ago on Metatrex episode number 21 called Uncle Manu's Cool Arm Cannon. So head on over to Metatrex if you want to hear even more conversation with Manu. You can also find me on Twitter. My handle there is just my name, at Zachary Fruling, and you can find me in the Babel Conference if you want to talk about Star Trek with me there. And how about you, Suzanne? Where can people find you on the Trek FM network and around the internet these days? Well, you can find me sometimes in the Babel Conference. I'll pop up here and there. And if you want to reach me on Twitter, my handle is at KJaneway8. That's the letter K, Janeway, and the number 8. So next week, we'll be taking a look behind the scenes at conventions. But until then, this has been To The Journey. (laughs) 